Hi, welcome everyone. We are really excited to host our very first live a webinar this month, and we are thrilled to have Melinda Kavanaugh with us talking with children about ALS, and that's a topic that she's an expert in. I'm Nicole Sammartino, Community Education Manager with the Les Turner ALS Foundation. For 40 years, the Les Turner ALS Foundation has been working with individuals with ALS, and we do know that when someone in a family has ALS, it impacts the entire family system, including children. Talking with children can be difficult because we aren't quite sure how to talk about it, what to say, or even when to say it. Yet, what we do know is that youth are hearing more and accessing more information online. Thus, it is critical for parents and families to start the conversation. This webinar integrates Dr. Kavanaugh's clinical experience and many years of research with children and families with neurological disorders to guide families in engaging with children and youth. Before I formally introduce you to Melinda, I would like to tell you a little bit about the foundation. We are leaders in comprehensive ALS care and research. We realize that people living with ALS may feel, feel overwhelmed and unsure of what questions to ask and what to do next. The Les Turner ALS Foundation exists to care for those affected by the disease, guide them to answers, support them and their loved ones, and provide hope through scientific research. We are grateful to have a support services team that is comprised of knowledgeable and compassionate nurses and social workers with many years of experience guiding people and their families affected by ALS. Through our great team and talented team, we're able to offer care visits by ALS support services coordinators, support group meetings with a variety of different populations, including those who have lost loved ones, um, to those who are living with loved ones with ALS right now. Educational materials and programs such as this one today. We offer access to medical equipment and communication devices, as well as need-based grant programs and community resources, and in-service education for community care. We are also able to offer a variety of opportunities for our patients through our Lois and Salia ALS clinic, such as access to enrollment in clinical trials and dedica dedicated clinical trial coordinators. We are Chicagoland's first and largest multidisciplinary ALS clinic with the highest number of neurologists and dedicated pulmonologists. And we offer um, access to no cost coordinated support and expertise from ALS support services coordinators from the Les Turner ALS Foundation. And lastly, being able to offer multidisciplinary care that brings together an experienced team of neuromuscular specialists in one clinic to provide comprehensive support for you and your family. Now I'm super excited to introduce you to Melinda. Um, we were really lucky enough to get to know Melinda a couple of weeks ago when she provided an in-service to our uh, support services team of nurses and social workers, and she talked about the importance of how we could help our families facilitate those tough discussions. And again, Melinda Kavanaugh is an expert on this, and you're really in for a treat today. She is a licensed clinical social worker and associate professor social work at the Helen Bader School of Social Welfare at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She is a leading expert in young carers and is the principal investigator for numerous research studies on families living with neurological disorders, including Huntington's disease and ALS. Working with the ALS Association chapters across the United States, Dr. Kavanaugh developed an evidence-based intervention program for young carers called YCARE, a multidisciplinary youth caregiving skills and support protocol for youth and families with neurological disorders. She has presented her work both nationally and internationally and has written several books for children, young adults, and families living with ALS. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kavanaugh.
Oh, technology. Hello, how is everybody today? Um, I am just so thrilled to be able to present to you um, this presentation on children and youth living in families with ALS and specifically really helping families understand how to talk with their children and youth, what are some of the barriers that families encounter in talking with children and youth, and I, I want to start off with kind of um, a, a laying the groundwork slide, if you will, because I get a lot of these questions. I get a lot of these um, concerns and emotions from families that this topic is very scary for families. And so for those of you on the call who are living with ALS or have a family member with ALS, you know, you very well might feel scared or helpless. Um, you might feel like maybe you don't even need this, but you're joining it just out of curiosity because you think your kids are doing okay. Or you maybe feel like ALS shouldn't be discussed in the family and it's something to kind of protect from our our children or our youth and our families. So what I, I wanted to put this slide together to just say, all of those feelings are perfectly okay. They're very normal. You are absolutely not alone in feeling those things. And the 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 interesting and, and very positive result of that is that people across the world living with ALS have very similar feelings. And the reason why it's very important for us to kind of sit with this is that we're gonna spend the next, you know, 40 minutes talking about really often uncomfortable situations. How do we support our children? What are some of the things that maybe our children are doing that are helping to care for you? So I just wanted to put it out there that however you're feeling right now, whatever uh, positive, negative, happy, sad, scared, it's all perfectly okay. And I just wanted to acknowledge that because I do know that families um, really feel all of these things. So as a supportive beginning, uh, I just wanted to put that out there. And why are we really doing this? So, you know, Nicole did a great discussion about all of the wonderful work that Les Turner does um, and the ALS Association does, but we know that in all of these wonderful programmings that the, the piece that often gets missed is that family and child and youth piece. And we know that ALS is a family experience. I've had so many family members say that to me over the years, that this is really a disease of the family because we're all so engaged in it. And that families need as much support as possible, but we know that the children and the youth out there aren't quite getting the same level of support. And often has to do with the fact that there isn't enough discussion in the home, in the family, or with our healthcare providers about how to have those discussions. And that can create um, some stressors in the family and some potential communication barriers. And if there's one thing that um, I hope that you get out of this talk is that the most critical piece is to communicate. Even if it feels awkward, even if it feels like maybe you're not saying the perfect thing or the right thing, by the way, those don't exist, but to communicate, to keep that, that talking open and available with your children and with yourself, because all of these things that are on this slide now, we know are, are very real and need to be addressed. And the best way to do it is to talk through it. So one of the things that I am kind of relying on is, is actually the book that I wrote about five years ago, I think. Um, and it was really uh, a collaborative effort with a lot of healthcare professionals to say, what do families know about ALS and how are they talking about it? And what we know is that people aren't talking about it. So um, if any of you are interested in a copy of this, we can certainly facilitate that at the end of this call, but just know that um, a lot of the information I'm gonna talk about in this presentation is actually found in this guide. So people ask a lot, how many children and youth are in families with ALS? And is this really that 
big of a deal to talk about because most people think about ALS as, you know, an older person's disease, right? Like, you know, typically 50s, 60s, maybe 70s. And that while that's true, we do see a larger number of younger individuals being diagnosed with ALS. And along with those younger individuals, we have families with small children. We also have families that are grandparent families where their grandchildren are very involved in their lives and very involved in wanting to understand what ALS is and how do we help take care of them. So while this is not always the first thing that people think about with ALS, it is a very important, critical, and really growing population um, of individuals who are experiencing affected by ALS. But the hard part is, is that it's really difficult to track how many children and youth are living in families with ALS. And um, several years ago, I did a study where we surveyed 100 families living with ALS, and two thirds of them identified as having a child in the home, in the family, um, engaged in care, wanting to know about ALS, wanting to be involved. But when we asked the families, you know, how do you talk to your children or your grandchildren about ALS, the majority of them said, we haven't. So why is that? Why is it that parents are really struggling to talk about ALS? And these are the three main reasons. By no um, stretch are they the only reasons, but here's what the families tell me. And they say, I don't want my child to have to think about it. They say, I think they're too young to really understand ALS and what's going on. But the most profound thing is, I don't know what to say. And, and that's really the, the bigger piece that we're gonna talk about today because I don't want them to think about it. That's really an issue of protecting and we'll address that later. They're too young. While certainly some children might be too young, you would be very surprised. Children as young as five are very much engaged in understanding that there are changes and there are differences and how do we understand that. But this piece about not knowing what to say is really powerful and it's really important. And so we're gonna spend a little more time on that today. So when we ask youth, what do they know about ALS? I think this is a really important slide because as we think about how to support families and for the families on this call thinking, okay, I need, I, 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 I want some really cool thing to help me understand how to talk to my child. It's really important to take a step back and say, what do kids even know now about ALS? And what we see is that they know a variety of things. They're able to describe it, some of them really impressively so, you know, that it's a disease that their, you know, their body isn't work and it slowly paralyzes him. It's a muscle disease. But then we have kids on the other end of the spectrum that say, well, he can't move. While that's true, there's not a lot of understanding about kind of why or how or progression. And then we also have, you'll see at the bottom of that list, that it's rare for a girl to get it. So that tells us that not only do youth have a variety of assumptions, information, um, but they have incorrect information. And that is so very important for all of us, whether it is a family member, a healthcare professional, whoever it is, it is critical for us to say, kids also have incorrect information. And Nicole said it at the beginning, a lot of that has to do with internet access and everything can be found on the internet, including correct information about ALS and including absolutely incorrect information. So as we move forward and we think about how we can help families talk about it, it's really important to think, where do kids know now? And, and this is something that you can ask your own children as you're thinking about starting this conversation or where do we start it. 
ask them what do they know because you might be surprised that they have this really powerfully accurate bit of information or they might say things like well girls don't get it or it's rare for a girl to get it and when we ask the youth you know what what do you want to know how how can we help you facilitate that they tell us over and over and over that what they really want is to be able to talk to the person with ALS, with their other adult in the family, with their grandparent. They really want that communication and they wanna be able to share and open and have that conversation. And I know that there's probably a lot of families on this call who are saying, you know, my child doesn't talk to anyone about anything. And I think that that's probably very true, that it can be very hard to get your children to talk about stuff. So we're gonna talk about that in just a second. But just know in the back of your mind that when we have talked with, and now I've across different disease order, disorders, I've interviewed several hundred, if not 500 youth, and the majority of them just want to be able to have that line of communication with the person living with the illness, regardless of what that illness is. So we think about broadly how we're going to address this. We know that families struggle with, I don't know what to say. We know that youth know a variety of information, accurate and in inaccurate. And we also know that youth say, I want to talk to my family about it. They want to talk and they know some about ALS, but it's often not enough to allay any sort of fears or concerns. And it might also be a different piece of information that might exacerbate those fears. So now we get to the point where I'm sure you're saying, but how do I do this? How do I talk to my child? And I will say the most important part is think about doing it when you're being in a very um, normal setting. You're watching TV, you're hanging out at home, maybe you're having dinner. This is a time where you can start having small entrees into the, the conversation. You can ask, what it is that they know. Um, have they done any research online? Have they looked it up? Making sure that you're always telling them it's okay whatever they say. Because one thing we know very, very clearly about children and families where there's a parent or a grandparent with an illness is they hold on to a lot of fear that they're going to hurt or offend or say the wrong thing to that person. So when you start the conversation and you model that it's okay to ask, what do you know about ALS? Or you can even ask and say, is there anything you wanna ask me? Is there anything you're curious about? The, the point is to be very honest and to start with basic information, You know, particularly with younger children. As we mentioned earlier, you know, obviously very, very young children, but even children as young as three, four, five, they notice those changes and they're not gonna understand them, but they know that there are things changing. And in my book, in that family guide, um, we have two pages that very specifically lay out understanding developmental stages. And at different developmental stages, children understand things differently. So for you to think about how to have that conversation with a five-year-old versus a 15-year-old obviously is very different. But it's the same idea in that you wanna start with some basic information, you wanna be honest, and always seek out experts. And those experts can be folks at your clinic where you see your neurologist, your pulmonologist, your care specialist, whoever it is. Don't hesitate to ask questions of them. Um, you know, are there maybe two or three kind of primary questions that you might have for them that might be able to translate into educating your child about what ALS is or is not. 
And this question I get a lot. What if I have a child that doesn't want to talk about ALS? And there's probably quite a few of you on this call who are thinking this exact same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, Dr. Kavanaugh. Sure, I'll have a conversation with my kid, but my child doesn't want to talk to me about ALS. They don't want to talk about kind of maybe anything. So I have two responses to that. First of all, don't push it, but be very, very clear that they can come to you at any time to ask a question, to uh, portray a fear, a concern, just keep that door open. At the same time, I want you know, everyone to just kind of think about this to consider because we do see this a lot. Children often don't want to talk about it or we think they don't want to talk about it because they get the impression that you don't want to talk about it. And it's not a blame and it's not anybody's at fault. It's that they're they're sensing, they're 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 concerned. They don't know. Maybe they've seen a reaction. Maybe they've they've seen that you've also struggled, which is completely normal and understandable. But if you're struggling with how you even feel about it, it's going to be very hard for a child who is not already a very um, verbally engaging child to come to you and ask questions. So something to sit with and kind of sit back and think about is how do you as a parent or a grandparent feel about having ALS? Or how do you feel about your partner or spouse having ALS? And are you maybe avoiding a conversation because you yourself are a little unsure? And that is, as I said at the very beginning of this talk, completely normal and understandable. And it's what makes this disease very much a family disease because we respond to, we feed off, and we gain support from each other in our family unit. And when one person's struggling, then other people aren't sure how to ask those questions. So this is a great point to stop, sit with it, how do I feel, and seek support. Go to your local organization, go to your local clinic, go to your local counselor and ask, you know, I, I just need to talk this out because when you're then at a place where you're a little more comfortable with it, you can have much more interactive conversations with your child or youth. The next thing that's going to happen is that you might have a child that's going to ask you 50 questions or maybe just four. And they're the four questions that make you the most squeamish. So what, how, think about how you would like to talk about it. What would make you comfortable? And this is, this is putting a lot of the onus on either the person living with ALS or their other adult in the home. How do you feel about it? And being very clear that you are willing to discuss difficult issues. And I've had a lot of families give me some examples of this over the years. And they talk about um, something that makes them uncomfortable with ALS. You know, maybe it's the loss of um, the ability to use their arms, or maybe it's um, that they can't get around as easy as they used to be. Maybe they're now using um, a power chair. So something that makes you feel a little uncomfortable because of the change and being willing to, again, model that to your child or grandchild and say, this makes me really uncomfortable, but I want to talk to you about it. Maybe we can kind of have a conversation about it. But if you don't have an answer, it is 100% fine to say, I don't have an answer. And that again is where like the folks at the Les Turner come in because then they can be able to step in and say, here's how I can help facilitate this conversation. Because what we do also see happen is that families kind of start it and they get to a place where there might be some conflict and there might be some tension, particularly if you have older youth, teenagers in the home, where they're just trying to figure out who they are as people. And then all of a sudden they have a parent who is different or not as 
quote unquote normal as maybe some of those other kids' parents. And that, that can be a real um, kind of internal struggle. They don't know how to deal with that. So while I said at the beginning, the communication is key, engaging with health professionals, engaging with the Les Turner Foundation, engaging with your local clinic is extraordinarily critical because then they can help you kind of model some of these conversations. This last issue comes up a lot um, when parents say, I don't want them to think about it. And I said that at the very beginning, and we had quite a few parents in our national study say that. They said, oh yes, I, I, I have ALS, my child is aware of it, my child um, does things to help me, but I don't want them to talk to you because I don't want them to have to think about it. And if you're thinking about that and you're thinking, but wait a minute, it's I'm, I'm protecting my child. True, there might be absolutely some protection that you, you know your child better than anybody. So if you have a very sensitive child, then we wanna be really thoughtful about that. And you wanna think about how that initial conversation and those conversations go. If you have a child who very much um, is driven by their emotions and is very sensitive. But if that's not the case, you know, I strongly encourage you to think about why you're protecting them. And if it's just that you don't know what to say, which is perfectly normal and it probably the most uh, common reason why, that's where you go and you engage with those trusted sources. Because what we see is when the conversations aren't happening because there is an intentional barrier and I'm using the word barrier in in a way that means um, a lack of communication or um, I, I don't want them to know what's going on or I don't want them to worry. What we see unfortunately is that um, that can foster some resentment in children that when that person living with ALS does pass away, there can be some real um, struggle and some complicated grief because they weren't able to work that out with them while they were still living. And that's not something that happens in every family, but unfortunately, I have seen it many times play out over the years when parents don't have that um, kind of uh, confidence or kind of solid base to say, I'm going to have that conversation with my child. And they put it off. They want to protect them. They don't want them to worry about it. And then they're gone. And then that child doesn't have that opportunity to really express and ask questions and be supportive. And the thing that's beautiful is that a lot of times all the children want is to be able to support their family member with ALS. They want to be there for them. So by, you know, quote unquote, protecting them, that's when you're kind of cutting off that opportunity for that child to be there and be supportive, which um, is a very lovely and very beautiful thing for children to be able to be a part of. But the key to all of this is to communicate, even if it's a difficult communication, even if there are some potential door slamming involved, it's, it's those steps to keep those communications open. Um, just a brief slide, and I, I, I had a wonderful time with the in-service with um, the folks at the, the Les Turner Foundation, but for any other healthcare professionals on the call, um, you know, again, we don't, we don't always think about the children and youth because they don't always come to clinic uh, for a variety of reasons, but the truth is a lot of families have children in them and kids often want to know more, they want to be involved, so that's a great opportunity for you all as healthcare professionals and organizations to really think about how can we support our families where we know those kids exist, we know they're there, they're just not coming into clinic. So um, just a slight plug in the middle of the presentation for all the healthcare professionals on the call to just think about what are the ways that we can be supportive of our families.
The next topic is, um, you know, obviously something I do a lot of research on, but is part and parcel of all of this because I have yet to meet a family living with ALS or really any other neurological disorders where there's a child in the home and the child does not do something to help uh, care for or provide some sort of support for that person living with the illness. And, and I, I love to situate this conversation with their own words because they're telling you that it is, you know, it, it, it is challenging. But what this youth is saying is, I'm really focusing on that person with ALS and I'm doing lots of things to take care of them. And this is a part of the family conversation that definitely does not get discussed as much. This idea that children and youth are providing care doesn't always make it into the conversation, but by looking at the words of the youth, we know they're out there and they're doing things to help take care of somebody. And, and I wanna say really clearly, caregiving by youth is not inherently bad. And this is also one of the um, reasons why a lot of the families in our study struggled to allow us to interview their youth because they were concerned, right? They were concerned that, having a child help them out or even just do minimal things would be seen as negative. And there was a certain amount of shame and stigma. Um, but it's not in and of itself a bad thing to have a child help out. But when there's no communication about it, when families are not talking openly about the kind of care they're providing, the things they need, how can they be helped, and they don't have that support, then what we see is the potential for negative outcomes. And when I say a negative outcome, I mean all of these things. And these are things that children have told me many, many, many times over the years that Oftentimes, they, the child will feel unappreciated because they don't really get, there's no real conversation about it. Um, but the adults struggle because they feel like a failure for relying on their child. And, you know, I've had lots of parents come to me and say, I just feel disappointed in myself that I have to have my 10 year old help me. And if there's, you know, one thing I can say about that is, is my hope for all of the people on the call who have ever thought that is to let that go. And, and I know that's very hard, but the, the amount of children who really genuinely want to help you is really extraordinary. And if you're feeling like that, I strongly encourage you again to reach out to your local um, organization with the, the Les Turner Foundation. They do such a wonderful job to engage families. Um, but also families are scared that the child's gonna be taken away. I mean, many times I've had people say, well, isn't that abuse and neglect? In and of itself, no, child caregiving isn't abusive and neglectful in the absence of true abuse and neglect, but families worry about that. So, so it creates this kind of bubble of non-communication, which again, is the last thing we want. So how can we talk about the, the amount of care that children are doing by um, you know, children who are younger than 12 years old, by you know, children who are doing care on a weekly basis, you know, after school. And the fact is that children don't have any training or support in what they're doing. So how do you talk to them about this? And this little, um, Play-Doh picture is during one of our Y Care trainings, we gave Play-Doh to the younger children and we asked them to just kind of make some art that represents um, their family. And she wanted to be really, really clear that um, she was physically connected to her dad who had ALS. So she was trying to do that by connecting all of the, um, the little Play-Doh arms. And, and what that shows is there's a, there's a real concern and there's a real love for the care that they're able to provide. And if you can let your children know that you appreciate that, right? And that you appreciate it whether they do it or they don't. Now this is kind of a complicated thing, but 
if your child is doing care, you want to be appreciative for of it. But even if they say, I can't do that or I don't want to do that, always remind them that that's okay because what the children often sit with is a feeling of guilt that they aren't there doing the care when they're doing something you know, after school or with their friends. And that's a really important piece for families to, um, if you haven't really explored that with your children, certainly do explore it because there is, and this has been borne out in a lot of my research, there is a feeling of, I should be at home when I'm not. So if you're reminding your youth, that's fine. You go and you, you know, be a kid. You go play with your friends. Appreciate them and let them know that that's okay and that you aren't hurting their feelings or you aren't or they you they, they aren't hurting you by not being there. So I hope I hope that helps in this this piece about caregiving because again it can be a very difficult thing for families to talk about. Going back to the previous slide, feelings of shame or stigma that I'm somehow not a good enough parent because my child has to help me. And that's simply not true. Um, but reach out to the local organizations, reach out to the Les Turner Foundation and all of their amazing care services folks, because they're the ones that are gonna be able to give you um, more of that support and more of that grounding and maybe some more of respite care so that your child can go and do the things that they wanna do. But I also want to recognize that there's definitely an economic piece here, and that should not be missed, and it, no one should feel the shame in that, because healthcare is expensive. Home health is, is often out of the reach of most people. And what we do know is that families who rely on children and youth for any sort of care primarily do it for economic reasons. So there should not be any shame or any guilt if you need to have your family member who just happens to be a youth or a child helping out. Um, and I, I don't think that gets discussed enough, but I just wanted to make sure that that's a supportive piece to this conversation. So, excuse me, always, always, always tell your children how you feel. And it's okay to say, I don't know how this makes me feel. This makes me feel uncomfortable. But what you're doing is modeling the ability for them to be honest, right? And I've interviewed a lot of parents where they say, I feel both. I feel proud and I feel guilty. I don't know if I should tell my child that absolutely tell them that you're proud of them but also say that you know they know it's difficult so that when they're sitting with their complicated feelings and they're sitting with their well i feel really good about it but i'm kind of tired of doing it that absolutely happens and we want to model those kinds of good conversations and good um, discussions about how i feel or how i don't feel and we see this played out in the children and youth in the research when we've asked them they say it makes me feel better about myself because kids like other humans like to do things that are helpful to others and make people feel good about themselves um, they feel good inside but at the same time they feel stressful and it feels hard so it's very very normal that you as an adult feel that kind of push and pull that positive that negative and that the child feels the push and pull, the positive and the negative, and they often feel them at the exact same time. So what you wanna do is go back to that conversation and model that, how are you feeling? And if you're feeling like it's a good thing and you're stressed at the same time, that's okay. That's totally normal. But the most important thing is that you're actually saying something about it and that you're having a conversation rather than worried that you're going to offend them or they're worried that they're going to offend you and then it just becomes this thing that no one addresses and that's the worst thing that you can do because that's when resentments and um, anger and frustration that's when all of those things boil up and I can't I can't encourage you enough make an appointment with um, the care coordinators 
ask them, is there something you can do to help us facilitate how we understand caregiving and that we all just have a lot of feelings? You know, everybody has a lot of feelings about it and to be able to talk about it and express it in however ways you can. And, and the nice thing is, is that a great way that kids can express things like I showed you through that Play-Doh is through art, having kids write down how they feel about it having children um, do an art project, whether it's painting or Play-Doh or drawing or writing in a journal or physically acting it out, right? Um, sharing through art is a great, great way. And if you as an adult can do it as well and kind of have a, a, a share your art moment and say, this is what this feels to me. Right. If you're having a hard time actually verbally communicating, a good way to communicate is to do some art and then share it and say ALS feels like this to me. And then your child will say, well, it feels like this to me. And then you can talk about how you created that and what that means to you. And those are really beautiful ways to engage your child, particularly your younger child. Um, I'm going to skip just a couple slides. My apologies. Um, I have just a few minutes, um, but I wanted to say that kids say explicitly how people can support them. So if you're thinking about, I don't know how to talk to my child. I don't know what to do. This really helps guide that conversation. They want friends. They want to be able to be with friends. They want people to treat their family normally. So when you're interacting with your adult friends and your adult community, talk to them about this. You know, when you interact with us, you know, just act like we're just normal because we are all normal. One, one youth in a study I did said, everybody has their thing, you know? It's just their thing that they have. Um, and children want the information and advice. Believe it or not, they want as much information and advice about the disease as possible. And that goes all the way back to our very first slide, which is talk about it in very concrete, realistic terms, say what it is and say what it isn't and ask them what they know, because they certainly have done some sort of internet searching off to the side, but we know that that's what they want. They want help with the care that they're doing, and they want their family member with ALS to have other people around them. Children are very altruistic at times, you know, we often think that they're, which is, you know, developmentally true, their worlds are very close to them, but they are able to step outside and see that. Um, reach out to friends and family, reach out to Les Turner, and reach out to your child's school. Um, the most recent book I wrote really has to do with helping school personnel understand how to talk to children who are living with ALS in their family. It's a very detailed guide. It has very specific support and um, guidance for teachers, for social workers, for counselors. Don't hesitate to get the support of your school. Likely they don't know enough about ALS, but once they're educated and once they have that information, they can be a tremendous support for your child, especially as you get towards the end of life, which many of you on the call might be asking about, um, but we are doing another webinar in a couple of weeks, really honing very specifically on grief and loss and death and dying and helping children understand that. And, and that can be one of the biggest stressors during school is as this child is dealing with that grief and loss, particularly if the child is dealing with that complicated grief, like I mentioned earlier, where they really didn't have the chance to kind of process through and then their person is gone and now they're really struggling. So, so don't hesitate to reach out to your schools. Um, I would love anybody who has reached out to their schools, any feedback, um, but it can be a really, really great resource. Um, youth programming is so, so critical for kids. And the primary reason is that they develop like 
peers. And as you're thinking about, okay, this was a lot of information. How do I think about talking to my child? If there's one concrete thing you can do is reach out to Les Turner and ask, how can we engage with other kids like mine? Because those kids really need to know they're not alone. They need to know that they're not the only person who has a parent with ALS. And it helps them process through. It helps give them education, right? So kids can talk about things in, in a different way than we do as adults. Um, and it also helps them build a, bright, a, a broader and a wider circle of professionals professionals that they now know. They now know, oh, wow, there's an occupational therapist. What does that person do? Here's what an occupational therapist does. Um, it helps kids feel like kids again. So if, if, if there's any opportunity, wherever your community is, if you're in the Chicago area, um, you know, certainly reach out to your local organization and ask about youth programming because it is just one of the most critical things that we can all do is put these kids together and get them supported. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is um, the books that, that I have written that are all based in all of my research. So all of the children and youth in these books are real people. They've told their real stories and they're written um, for different ages. The middle one is a graphic novel that's written for young children. Um, the It's different and hard is for kind of that tween middle school kind of really somewhat awkward age where it gives lots of examples of how other kids have dealt with things, almost like a choose your own adventure adventure book. And then the last one, The School Friends Work, that's for more um, young adults. And that's a very specific population. Kids who might be putting off college, maybe putting off having a family of their own in their early 20s because they're trying to figure out how do they still support their parent um, with ALS. So all of these books, um, uh, Les Turner has copies of them. We can certainly get more, um, but they're, they're, they're really great tools for kids to be able to feel like, again, they're not alone. Um, and this is a quote that I love. Um, when I asked youth uh, during one of our Y care sessions, you know, what would what would you say to another youth um, your age that might have a family member? And and kids have the most amazingly wonderful advice. They talk about patience. Um, they talk about, you know, learning how to deal with it and that, you know, you just have to adapt. And I, I put this up here for the parents on the call who might be unsure of how their child would react or what their child would say in certain settings. And the truth is, um, by communicating with your child, by being engaged with them, by modeling that things are difficult, but that we're gonna work through it, you get this kind of um, statement from a youth who says, you know, gosh, we just have to work through it. And that comes from conversation and modeling and support by their parents. Um, so I cannot to thank you all enough. I'm gonna skip through to um, the last quote from a parent who said, uh, thank you for thinking about the children and youth because it is a family, absolutely. Um, and just a big thank you to all of the families who participated in my research. Um, there is a video that I didn't show because um, not a huge shock, but I did talk a little too much. So um, there is a video that, that you can watch. Um, a young man whose name is Ian, who is just one of the most remarkable young people I've, I've ever come in contact with. And he tells us a little bit of his story. So when you watch it again online, you can see his video. And there's my information. And um, I am going to stop sharing and um, turn it over to Nicole. And thank you all so very much. Melinda, you and I will stay on together um, to address some of the questions that came in. But I wanted to just acknowledge, um, Dr. Kavanaugh, you really did a beautiful job of really acknowledging the full range of emotions that come with conversations like this, how difficult they are, sort of normalizing that for people. But 
most importantly, I thought it was fantastic to provide these tangible resources, um, tools. I feel like you provided like a toolkit, uh, a sort of a map to how to navigate this situation. So thank you for that. And the other thing that came to mind when I heard you talking was, it sounds to me like when you have, this is an opportunity an opportunity for growth and connection within the family that may not have ever been there if you didn't have that conversation. So I sort of see it as a gift you give one another. How would you how would you see that? Oh, absolutely. And you know what? Families have said that kind of thing before, particularly if it's with um, youth who are at different developmental stages who seem like they're kind of, you know, normally trying to differentiate or kind of separate a bit from the family. Um, yes. It really, really can bring families together because it does require all hands on deck at a certain point. Um, and, you know, some kids have said, well, you know, my dad is now like he's here. I get his full attention. I'm right, he's right in front of me, so I'm gonna ask all these questions. I'm gonna engage with him. So yes, there are so many positives that can come from this really overwhelming situation. That's great to hear. It's reassuring and, and we, we you provided so much good information. We did get some questions that I wanted to share with you. Um, the first question we received, Melinda, is, um, uh, let's see, my daughter is three and a half years old. Lately, she has been more aware of my ALS symptoms and she asks often about my physical limitations. What is the best way to explain to her my condition and my symptoms? It's a really good question for someone so young. So a child that young, they're still very, very concrete thinkers. Like, so think about things as black and white. So you're not gonna give a lot of examples. You're not gonna go into, a, you know, a, a different um, extended discussion. You're going to acknowledge, yeah, my arm doesn't work that way. What do you think? What is it like when your arm goes like this? Um, and say it as a very concrete, straightforward way. You don't need to give lots of examples and you don't need to elaborate, but a good thing is, is just to make it normal. Yep, this is what's happening. Now this is the way I look, mom looks, dad look, whoever it is, right? And then incorporate that in a very normal way into their day. I love that normal CPs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kavanaugh. We have another question and I encourage anyone else, if you have questions, put it in the question and answer box and we will uh, do our very best to get to your question. Um, how do I talk to my daughter who's seven years old that her favorite human has ALS and that she won't be getting better? And the dreaded conversation yeah. about <laughs> passing away and really taking in this time now. Yes. That's a tough taking, one. Taking the time and out. This is this is such a tough one. And, and you know, again, in a couple of weeks, we're gonna spend a whole session just on grief and loss and death and dying. But I'm wondering, not knowing your family, I'm wondering if she might really benefit from some of the art, some of the art and exploration, even working with the person who has ALS to kind of put together some memories or some descriptions about things that you've loved doing, you know, looking through photo albums, creating something special that says, this is the way, you know, we did this and, and create um, a new painting or writing things down to where it, it maintains that special feeling, but she's able to express the difficulty and the emotion in this and that she's doing it alongside the person with ALS and you know creating those memory boxes or memory books you know people call them lots of different things they're such a wonderful option because you're doing it with the person and that you're both you know able to kind of be emotional about it and and be happy and be sad and then you have this thing that over time she can go back to and and really hold on to it as a beautiful memory that not only she created it with them but then it reminds her that's beautiful i love the benefit of the now and then concept of and benefiting from that that's that was thank you um any other questions that i'm let me look in the chat box um Okay, let's see. Um, one more um, that I received. Tell us a little bit more, Dr. Kavanaugh, how this topic um, today, this webinar, will relate to the one that you're going to do on April 8th for us. 
Yeah, so um, you'll notice I didn't talk a lot about end of life, and that's because um, we're really saving it for that conversation um, in a couple weeks. Children, depending on their age, depending on their exposure, can often struggle with like, what is grief and why am I feeling this way? And, and one of the big things kids feel is anticipatory grief. Like we, we know that something's gonna happen, I'm not sure what it is, you know, suddenly I can't play football with my dad and I'm feeling this weird way, what is that? That's that anticipation of, it, it's going to keep changing and at some point it will be permanently changed, right? So what we want to be able to do is spend some time talking about how you can talk with your kids about death and dying, how you can help them through this grieving process and make it kind of a normal grieving process as opposed to what I talked about earlier in one of my slides was that complicated grief. Like they really weren't able to process things out with their parent. Maybe there's someone like the, the questioner earlier with that seven-year-old who really wasn't able to do something with their loved one and then they pass and they don't have that that memory of that shared positive experience and that can create some real difficulty down the line so we're going to spend time talking about the different types of grief how you understand it how you can help your children understand it so that they don't get caught in a more complicated grief uh, kind of cycle if you will over time sure well, that's, that's really helpful. And we cannot wait to have you back next, next month. That sounds like it's going to be just a perfect complement to what we're talking about today. So we're excited to continue the discussion, Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, so let's see, where are we? We are, I, you can see the slide that we um, are inviting you to our next uh, webinar with, with Dr. Kavanaugh. But we also want to invite you to our um, celebration of life, um, to remember your loved ones lost to ALS. That event is happening virtually on June 12th, 2021 via Facebook Live. And then we have, uh, lastly, we, I want to ask you to please save the date for our 11th annual Les Turner Symposium on ALS happening November 8th, 2021. The symposium features presentations from leading ALS clinicians and researchers, including members of our Lois and Salia ALS clinic at our Les Turner ALS Center at Northwestern Medicine. And I'd like to give a big thank you to all of you that attended today. I know it's a difficult um, topic for all of us and I commend you for showing up and I'm sure you will show up in a way that is um, important for you and your family to have these tough conversations. We look forward to seeing you next month. And before you uh, log off today, you will get a survey that we ask you to fill out because your feedback is really important to us. So thank you again, and we'll see you next month. Bye, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. <laughs>